been like looking into the future in terms of revamping TV shows or making sequels to movies and measuring marketing campaigns. So it's a very uh, interesting time um, all across town. So uh, we've got a great panel set up here and uh, we're w live webcasting and uh, looking forward to a pretty cool uh, session here. Um, so we're gonna sort of just jump into the talk and um, in a little while we'll do introductions to everybody and what everybody does, but we're just gonna sort of jump in head first. A um, few things that are happening literally, you know, as we speak in the last few days, um, today is the launch of Disney Plus, which everybody's been uh, waiting for. And last week, uh, Apple dropped their uh, new streaming pro programming platform integrated into their existing platform with new original content. And then another little side note is Instagram making an announcement about how they're going to basically hide like counts to the public and and the effect of that. So little big things and little things mixed into the conversation here, all of which wrap around data and creative data. Um, so the first thing I just wanted to throw at the panel is, you know, just on the television side, all of us are involved in television at some level. You know, Nielsen ratings have obviously been the currency forever and still are to this day as as everything shifts and changes. But what are you all finding is the change in terms of how TV shows, whether it's creators or producers or the networks, are how are they measuring success? What are you all finding? Brooke? I will start. Um, it's, in our space, we're uh, focused on the digital landscape, so a lot of the additional measurement comes from that social data, so analyzing what type of data we get from Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, TikTok, et cetera, around their activations and their campaigns. But I think that's supplemental when you're looking at network television. So obviously it's one data component, but they want to look at eyeballs. Um, and then if you're talking about an HBO or a streaming component, um, obviously they're analyzing different types of data, right? So Netflix has an advantage that no one else does where they can see and manage and maintain their subscriptions and really use their data less for um, you know, directional creativity from an episode to episode standpoint, but more about you know, how do they tune in and how do they display their content to the right people. So it's one element is what we're seeing is the social data component. Uh, Derek? Yeah, thank you. Hello, Derek Forbes, CEO of Stardust. And so I think in the past, uh, releases, particularly movie releases, have been all about the dollars that they drive starting with the box office, and that's now starting to shift quite a bit towards just the number of streams that they garner as the ultimate measure of success, and with Disney Plus launching and all of the other streaming services coming online, they're moving into the world that Netflix has been living in for years now, which is, it, it's all about the engagement that the content gets to help drive subscription. Tanya, what are you, uh, what are you seeing in terms of the network's needs for measurement of programs? Well, I, I think, you know, there's, like if we stick with straight television networks, you know, the big challenge, of course, is ratings are down. Like, so pretty much every, ma oh, you can't, can you guys hear me in the back? No, all right, hang on. How about now? Better. Okay, excellent. Um, you know, it, it's every award show stuff's down 20, 30, in some cases 40% year over year. So. Um, so I think many of the networks are looking to ancillary platforms like social to start to tell the story and go, hey, like, that's not the whole picture, right? It's saying, how else can we measure interest? How else can we measure enthusiasm? Um, how else can we get a sense for some of those harder to measure audiences that might not be picked up by traditional ratings? Um, so I think, you know, even when it comes to syndication deals or licensing deals, um, many of the originators of television programming are telling the story about the importance of their programming, 
using social as opposed to purely looking at traditional ratings. Talon, what are you, what are you saying? Yeah. Um, so we work with um, a lot of the networks and um, some of the big streaming partners as well. And one of the things that we found is, you know, very similar to what um, Brooke and Tanya were talking about, um, is that social data is only one piece of the story. And so what we're helping a lot of the clients do is when you take a more holistic approach um, in terms of like blending social to see how social data is maybe helping drive viewership or vice versa, that's typically when you start to see and like make these inferences around um, you know audience behaviors. Earlier to your point around like Nielsen data, the whole measurement for Nielsen, the the entire kind of um, objective for them is is mainly to fuel ad dollars. That's that's really the whole point. Um, and so for a lot of the streaming platforms that we have been working with. Um, we've been justifying like why partnerships should work because of the quality of the audience that the show is able to retain or maybe that the movie is able to drive. Um, and basically using that type of data in terms of an audience's propensity to spend with that particular brand. Um, and we're, we're sort of moving away from Nielsen, but Nielsen data in terms of viewership is, is still one piece of the variable. And Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think to, to Brooke's point, there's been a a proliferation uh, in terms of content that's out there <clears throat> and also the number of platforms that are out there. So Nielsen TV ratings aren't enough anymore. And it's, you know, there used to be sort of, sort of like one monolithic culture where you had network television and then you had, you know, these, uh, you know, studio movies. And now you have a ton of different social platforms that are delivering content. So it's not just TV or cable or Netflix. It's also YouTube and TikTok. And I think that um, what we see in our data is that there's been a real generational shift where there's not one single place that everyone is viewing content now and that you have to think about um, that sort of uh, fragmentation of the audience and what each sort of component is uh, going to be interested in viewing and how you measure it and there's not one single source uh, of data for that. So obviously with more and more networks launching and converging and a few that may go away and millions of touch points, um, you know, data is going to become a more critical and complicated component for everything that goes, you know, that gets picked up or canceled. Um, but one of the things that we've seen certainly over decades is when you're pitching an idea, you know, if you can say, oh, and we've got a star connected to our you know, project that we're pitching that has, you know, 10 million fans and followers um, that hopefully can, you know, help you sell something through. What are you all seeing in terms of uh, creators, whether it's, you know, a YouTube series or a feature film, um, how they're using data to sell things? Brooke? I'm happy to start here <laughs> as we live and breathe in this world. So uh, I think this is everyone across the space is trying to use big data to tell stories. So it's not only the creator, it's the agent, it's the brand, it's the media company. Everyone is trying to analyze the potential audience and impact that that will bring across different platforms and networks. One thing that I've seen people do really well is use that data to inform their pitch. Obviously it's one component. Um, so we work with a lot of the talent agencies and they'll use it to measure their talent against other talent that they don't represent. So how did they perform historically? How would they potentially perform in the future if they're uh, running the show and providing a lot of activation? And I think historically, we've seen quite a lot of success with shows leveraging their talent to help get that buzz out there. So that's something that we frequently see, but it's really, across the gamut. Everyone is trying to analyze that potential audience and data. And then I've also seen some networks get really creative to try and incorporate digital talent into their traditional programming components and do digital assets that match with that narrative and that story that they're doing at the same time. So they're all analyzing the audience and the impact that that might have for the creator and the talent similar to the creator or the talent. 
What else you got? Sure. Sure. So, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And obviously, you know, stars being attached to a project can have a huge impact on its social awareness and therefore on whether it gets greenlit. Um, but the other thing that I think we're seeing a lot more of now is uh, when a good project is attached to an established um, set of IP with a franchise. Um, so you see now that Game of Thrones has finished their producing various spin-offs, which will instantly have an audience because it's such a, a massive hit. Um, with Breaking Bad, you know, spinning off into into El Camino and um, and Better Call Saul, and then now the Star Wars, of course, being turned into a universe beyond just the movies and the theme parks with the Mandalorian uh, just coming out today to support in a big way the release of the Disney Plus platform. Which also, you know, leads to the whole idea of spin-offs and franchises and reboots, which is essentially what a television show is. A television show is a series of shows. I like the pilot. I want to see this play over the course of the next three or four months and watch it again next year and next year and next year. And, you know, we see lots of, you know, conversation that criticizes reboots and remakes in Terminator from last week and so forth, yet that is what makes the studios go round. Franchises are what life is all about. Um, and so that's an interesting sort of, you know, dilemma and hurdle and challenge is to find the next big hit. What are you all, you know, seeing in terms of, you know, like, finding form formats and repeatable ideas or, you know, a food show that can become, uh, you know, the next, you know, global sensation? Well, I think, I think there's, there's two elements. So, so one, you've got uh, spin-offs being really popular because they're just low risk, right? So if, you, if you, you're dealing with an audience where you, you don't really know what's going to hit, right, you've got all these different people you've got to please, if you know that something's worked in the past, right, you can, you can, you can de-risk yourself. The other way you can de-risk yourself in uh, what we see is um, looking at data to find uh, less expensive options. So um, how do you find someone who's up and coming or has, let's say, an audience that's growing but they're not firmly established yet? And so you can create more content more cheaply um, and you can sort of hedge your bets on not having that one really expensive project uh, be successful and you've got uh, a number of options, each of which has, you have some reason to believe is going to hit the segment that you would like to reach. So on the marketing side, let's talk about how the networks, whether it's streaming networks or standalone digital series or broadcast or cable networks are using data to make decisions. So just on the, in terms of marketing campaign side, what are you all finding that the networks are asking for? What are their problems and what are you all delivering to them to help solve these marketing problems? Yeah, so um, just based on some of the networks that we work with, when it's, I think it's understanding the audience because that's ultimately where it starts from. Um, an when you're looking at audience data, it ultimately s tells a story in terms of, especially when you're looking at it through the marketing lens, of who are the people who are persuadable, who are the people that are advocates, and then who are the lost causes. And when you think about, um, when you think about like marketing campaigns, there's a level of investment that's being put forth, and essentially the efficacy of those marketing dollars is purely dependent on a network's ability to reach the persuadables and the advocates and to not spend their money on the lost causes. So what, what we're providing networks is more around that audience data of how can we get so hyper-targeted and define the micro-segments that are going to minimize the risk of that campaign's investment. Yeah, I mean, I'll, Tanya? I'll, yeah, I'll weigh in. Um, I mean, I would say, you know, I don't know what everyone else thinks, but like there's sort of a, a differentiation between using data to originate ideas and stories, which I kind of think isn't happening that much. Um, I don't know if anyone has good examples, but I feel like I was like heartbroken a couple years ago. Does everyone remember the Netflix House of Cards? How everyone was like, yeah. this was the case example for like using data to 
create a great series. And then you learn, like, oh, actually, no, they'd already pitched it to HBO, and HBO had passed. And then it got pitched to Netflix, and they, and they probably used data to decide, you know, maybe some of the things I can't reach it do. I can either do it like this or I can do it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to have to just pick this up. All right, we're going to make this work. Um, you know, so I, so I was pretty heartbroken because it, it sounded as if it was originated based on data, but really it was kind of backed by it. Um, and I think that's a distinction. You know, I, I see that a lot on the marketing side where I still think the core of, or even, you know, programming research and all of that, I don't know that ideas for new series are coming out of that yet. Maybe it is in some cases, but I still feel like in large part the creatives do what the creatives do and then maybe we look at it with data and go, okay, well, this one seems like it might be more popular because everyone loves skaters now and, you know, the lead character loves skateboard or whatever it is. Um, so we're sort of seeing a bit of a divide, but still not much when it comes to ideating, but a lot more when it comes to using data to sort of back your hunch or maybe look a little closer on whether something should be done or not. Supportive data. Right, yeah, but I, I don't think it's coming, like it's kind of defining the edges of the sandbox, but it's not kind of coming up with ideas yet, which would be cool. I think you're spot on on that point, and, um, and very much it's about the targeting of the marketing and who you are connecting with to try and build an audience, but there are some cases, we saw this morning where um, the new trailer of Sonic the Hedgehog came out, which if you recall a few months back, it was not well received on social media, and they've used that feedback to directly go back into the creative process and redevelop the character. That may be more possible with a digital film like that than, than other films, but um, I think you know there are a few examples where, where that kind of thing has happened. Yeah, I would agree that there's not a whole lot coming out of the ideation phases, but more tweaking and using data to back up decisions from campaign to campaign purposes, or often as you roll out into new markets, too. That's frequently where you see people tweak things. Um, obviously, not as easy if you're streaming something to do so, but that will vary depending upon the content vehicle that you're sending the information to. Um, Um, so I just want to show a slide here. Um, this is a slide that we've shown for a while now. This is uh, John Landgraf from FX has been doing this graph at the uh, big TV conference that happens at the end of the year that's showing basically the trend and growth of scripted programs over time. And you can see on the far left, uh, that's 2002, but then 2010, there were 216 scripted programs produced, and last year, the total was 487 scripted programs, and the growth was obviously in the purple, which is streaming, which you can't really see the legend there, but purple is, these are uh, online and streaming programs, which have grown from 48 to 90 to 117 in 2017. And then last year, that went from 2017 to one, I'm sorry, 117 to 160. So obviously the trend is enormous and unlimited, obviously on the streaming side because there is unlimited shelf space. So all of these things seem like assumed and obvious, but the effect that that's going to have across the board in terms of, you know, viewership and as new platforms are now being delivered and questions about where my show can be seen given my service and how much am I paying for bundles and skinny bundles and a la carte, you know, the next three years is going to be wildly exciting. And so the next slide I wanted to show you is this is the content pipeline. The, these are the major streamers that exist and are that are launching in the next few months. Obviously, Peacock will come in the next uh, quarter, we believe, and then uh, HBO Max also, which will come uh, in the spring. Um, but the question and issue and 
challenge that everybody is looking at are where is this content coming from in each case. So here's another little slide that shows, you know, Hulu, which is basically being fed by ABC, Fox, and NBC, and that's sort of a combination of what's going on over at Peacock. Prime, which is basically self-generating content, ABC. So you can see, and then, you know, on the HBO Max side, an enormous amount of con content from the Warner Brothers Library, HBO's library, the CW, Turner Networks, and then Disney now with Fox and ABC and Disney's library. So the landscape for the future is super wild and connected and disconnected all at the same time, which creates enormous opportunities for everybody in this room to help uh, ride the wave here. So we sort of hang on that slide for a moment. And so given you know the notion of all of the these you know, chess pieces being played, you know, before our eyes, three-dimensionally and old deals and new deals and new platforms. What are you all sensing or seeing in terms of how decisions are being made in terms of content and deals and syndication and things like that? Yeah, so I think um, especially with this landscape, uh, what that means in terms of how we're being approached by a lot of the networks and the studios that we work with is it's ultimately going to be a battle of attention, especially the more fragmented it gets. Um, so that, the implication for that is how do, like from a consumer standpoint, how do we, how do we make consumers um, aware of the particular content and how do we get it to resonate with them? Um, so it's going to become increasingly more important to um, emotionally trigger consumers and find the values that are going to resonate with them so that they can engage with the content, especially as it becomes more fragmented. Yeah, I think really the, the important thing, because there's, there's so much fragmentation, how do, how do you persuade a consumer to subscribe to your service? And really it's about having shows that are unmissable and for any given consumer what is an unmissable show it varies depending on the person right so i may be addicted to the bachelor you may be addicted to riverdale and and often that falls along demographic lines but it doesn't always and if you can figure out like this the set of people that you're going after and what are the unmissable shows and create the social buzz around them, because that's the other important thing, is what are my friends all talking about, and therefore I have to watch it as well to be part of the conversation, then you can have a winning formula. But not, not everyone's going to win. And so I think there will be some that go away and probably some consolidation. Do you, do you think some of any one of those networks or streamers are going to fade away? Well, I'm not going to pull out a prediction of <laughs> any, any specific one. I mean, I can't imagine it, HBO not, Max or Disney going away. Well, ever. I don't think it's necessarily going to be an entire company or brand that goes away, but they may end up partnering with other, other providers, content sharing, uh, varying the model from what they're launching with. Well, one thing to add is obviously Disney has a massive advantage <laughs> uh, in conjunction with their partnership with Hulu. It's really going to shake up the space quite a bit. Um, and I think given the content that they have on Disney+, Plus, the Fox con or the Simpsons content that is really big, they're able to diversify their audience and have some of those I can't miss moments that you're talking about. So that's going to definitely shake up the space. And I think you will see some type of consolidation. But the other thing, as we all know, Amazon is not as dependent upon their streaming service. It really is an, you know, an additional aftermath, but they have excellent content. So as a consumer, if there's unmissable content, how do you get your tentacles in? So it is a fight for eyeballs, but it's also a fight for similar thing to the social platforms, fight for attention overall. And the more you can get that content to be dead on to someone and engage with their audience and their friends, the better. And I'll just add, like we recently did a study that uh, 
sort of looked at whether there was any existing loyalty. Because um, I think a lot of people go, oh, wow, you know, people really love Netflix, so they really, really love this. Um, and what we saw was uh, consumers just don't really give a crap about how they, like, there's no loyalty, right? Like, no one's like, I'm only going to watch it if it's on Netflix. And I think that's a big, that's a big shift because not that long ago, people defined themselves as an HBO viewer or, like, specific around networks and... Um, then suddenly, like, TV just got good across the board and a lot of great programming came out. So it's really going to be title by title. But, I mean, we were looking, even among 18 to 24-year-olds, like, the average was accessing um, content through, like, three or four different apps. Um, and there was no sense of preference. It was just uh, how quickly can I figure out where I can get something that I want to watch. And then once I've watched that, is there anything that keeps me there or do I go back to the well and then sort of seek out where I can view? So, you know, the, the fight is really um, around content um, and it's going to be less about experience. Like no one, you know, other than ad-free versus not ad-free, um, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of um, stickiness to single platforms. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's going to be a continual thing of like how do you have a never-ending stream of content um, how do you manage a lot of that? And we'll see that pressure on Netflix, like losing Marvel and losing a lot of those really, um, you know, big things that have brought people to their platform. I think that's a huge point, Tanya, because when MTV got rolling, it really defined itself as a network for a demographic. And, you know, when you turn on the television, what channel are you tuned into or what do you go to first? NBC was that way for a while as well, CBS, um, and certainly over time, and, and granted the same with Netflix and now YouTube as a network for first choice for certain, you know, audiences. Um, and so given all of that as a, as a streaming platform, and there's loads of conversation and controversy and questions and issues about what the net streamers are looking at, especially Netflix, who has, you know, momentum at a huge level, you know, what are the streamers, you know, measuring? What are they looking at? What defines a hit? Not everything, you know, the assumption for a while was everything that Netflix is going to uh, produce is obviously based on their proprietary data. So, but they cancel shows and they make one season of certain shows and that's it. So not everything is a hit d despite whatever their proprietary data is. What are you all seeing and feeling in terms of how the streamers are measuring or what are they looking at internally and what are they looking at externally in terms of data? Well, I think it's, it's the idea of what a hit is. Like Netflix may want to start to, for example, build up a bunch of niche shows that appeal to a certain demographic. Because what we see is that there's just, because of so much choice there is uh, in entertainment, there is um, a lot of sort of segmentation about who watches what, right? So, so my company, we do a lot of uh, analysis of music audiences and understanding like how different genres appeal to different types of consumers. But one of the things that we look at is um, genres of TV shows. So we've got, you know, something like 20 different genres of TV shows that we look at, you know, we sort of segment out sort of different types of reality shows, different types of talk shows across the 900 genres that we track and the, you know, the over 2 million artists that we have in our system. And so what we see is there actually is a, a ton of segmentation. So there's not, the, again, there's not uh, going to be, there, there'll be, there will be hit shows that kind of have this broad cultural appeal. But you can also win by, um, by addressing audiences that have been historically under-addressed or by addressing, for example, like geek comic book culture, right, which might be a subset of uh, overall sort of pop culture, but you can have a kind of a cult hit. And maybe that's enough to get people to keep their subscriptions because at the end of the day, if you're subscribing to multiple services, maybe there's one or two shows that appeal to people who um, they can't find that content elsewhere. So I think there's a real incentive to think about how do you address underserved audiences and create real passion content. I think it's pretty similar to, you know, um, especially like with video games, like how do you continue driving retention? Um, so one of the studies that we've done internally 
is uh, we looked at like content pieces um, because the ultimate goal for a Netflix or for a Hulu is how do I keep the person paying for the specific subscription? Um, and so one of the things that we looked at, uh, among many things, but the overall kind of insight was that it typically takes anywhere between three to four pieces of content to keep a subscriber engaged and continuing to pay for the service and, and tuned in to that specific streaming platform. Um, and so I think what that means, especially like to your point, is it's no gone are the days of, of like macro and, and reaching like large audiences and casting a wide net there. Um, especially as we move into more of that personalization economy, it's becoming increasingly more important to find the three to four shows for a specific person that are going to get them to watch and keep them engaged. And as a result, while that process is happening, what the streaming platforms are doing is collecting data around at what points are the drop-offs happening and how can we use that, those insights to inform future pieces of content because they, they need to keep the cycle going for the consumer to keep paying. So I think that's, that's what we're seeing. Um, so I think this is a good time to uh, uh, set, uh, set up basically our panel and do uh, introductions now that we've got a nice room of people here. And um, first let's do, a, why don't you just introduce yourself and you know talk about real quick what you do at your job. What is your daily job task all about? So Brooke, let's start with you. Hi there, I'm Brooke Hennan. I'm Senior Director of Customer Success at Creator IQ. And at Creator IQ, we uh, help our clients, media companies, brands, and agencies analyze their influencer marketing programs and branded content programs. I work with our success team, so essentially we're in charge of making our clients successful. Day to day, we help them with managing their campaigns and influencer outreach and research in the platform and really ensuring that we're hitting their KPIs as they've evolved, just like you mentioned with the Facebook one today. So. Hello, I'm Derek Forbes and I am the CEO and founder of Stardust. Is that loud enough? <laughs> That's good. And Stardust is a social media app all about movies and TV shows. You can follow all your favorite shows and movies and then get updated on all the news about them um, as well as what other fans are saying about them, um, discuss them with people that are also into the same content and whatnot. And it's really fun, you should check it out. Hey everybody, I'm Tanya Yuki. I'm the founder and CEO of Shareably. Um, we're the largest provider of uh, social media competitive benchmarking and intelligence across platforms. Hi guys, my name is Tallinn Kutnuyan and I head up the research and analytics team at Influential. Um, influential, uh, you know, we're a data uh, conversion company in terms of like we work with clients um, to help them drive their return on investment, whether it's using influencers to drive sales or foot traffic, awareness, changing brand perception. Um, so I help with that part of the business. Hey, I'm uh, Jeff Rosenfeld. Uh, I'm the SVP of product and technology at Music Audience Exchange. So what we do is we use data to pair up brands with music artists for partnerships. So the brands can be anything from like consumer packaged goods all the way to uh, 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 Hollywood studios. And so um, and what we do is we, we, and my job personally is we, we have all this technology that we, we use AI to understand how uh, audiences of various artists and genres um, appeal to different types of consumers. So you know a brand comes to us to say, hey, we're trying to reach um, people who are health conscious and are hikers, they tend to skew female, they fall into this age range, and what we can do is we can, so we can comb our database of over two million artists to say, all right, here are some big, uh, big artists who might be a good fit, or here are some up and coming artists that might be a good fit, and uh, we can then partner them up, and we do all the licensing, we do the content creation. And I'm Mark Carson from Relish Mix, and we are a marketing analytics firm here in Hollywood. Um, and we deliver tracking uh, data to movie studios and TV networks, and then super high level tactical reports that tell them how to adjust campaigns for greater success. Um, and so that leads to another you know, big question with all of this creative data 
positioning, which is um, tactics. You know, things are not looking so good, and here's an idea of how we can move the needle or reallocate or reposition the campaign or the show. Um, what are some of the things that you guys are starting to see and and recommend to your clients across the board? Because, you know, three years ago, you know, there were things that you couldn't recommend just because, you know, there was no ability to actually turn on a certain tactic. But certainly on our side, we see loads of opportunities that absolutely make a big difference. What are you all seeing? Across, you know, in whether it's television or film, that helps adjust campaigns. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing is that there is a, a move towards um, storytelling and uh, personal connection. So, you know, previously, I think there's been a lot of emphasis on awareness. So, you want everyone to know when when the new season of a show is, and it's all about banner ads and kind of finding sort of like the cheapest sort of possible way to implement your marketing program. I think there's been an awareness that those sorts of awareness campaigns aren't effective anymore and people kind of tune them out. And so the question is, is how do you use um, various platforms in order to connect with consumers and create an experience where they connect with, let's say, an actor from, from the project um, through, let's say, an Instagram story um, or sponsored content that um, can sort of overcome that gap that's sort of, uh, that let's say an awareness campaign can't do. I think one of the things that um, have really helped us uh, with the recommendation of tactics to the studios and to the networks that we work with has been um, using social as one piece of the puzzle to surface the insights and the actionable recommendations that matter. Um, so what I mean by that is, is demographics um, as, as, a, as an input or as a data source is becoming less and less predictable. Things are so fluid these days. Um, and it's super hard to just rely simply on social data or demographics data to inform what the tactical um, and the actual recommendations should be. Um, so I would say that we, we have to look at it the same way that we look at the body, right? The body is composed of a skeletal system, there's a nervous system, there's a muscular system, and we can't look at things as just compartmentalized. Um, so one of the things that we have been doing is we've been blending demographics data, with psychographics, with behavioral, with attitudinal, with insights around, you know, what content are they engaging with, both from a format standpoint, um, as well as from like an overall interest and affinity standpoint. What are they purchasing online and offline? And the more we can craft a story that holistically shows every single element, the more we can surface what those consumers' emotional triggers are. And if we understand their emotional triggers, um, so, for example, do they prefer nostalgia content over any other type of content and why? Um, that can help inform everything from the media mix to the type of creative as well as like the overall distribution strategy. What are some of the other tactics that you guys are seeing that move the needle well? I mean, especially, you know, let's talk about influence. We can move into the influencer component. Obviously, entertainment marketing has the dream marketing tool, which are movie stars and actors with huge followings, which is what consumer brands pay for. Certainly, shows paying for their talent. But when you have an influencer or an actor, you know, if you have The Rock or Kevin Hart, or Tiffany Haddish in your show, and they're gung-ho to spread the word, that's the ideal scenario. Uh, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have a great actor who's non-social, uh, and that becomes another issue. So what are you all f seeing, and where, where are things going on the influencer side in terms of marketing and promoting TV and streaming and movies? Oh. I'll jump in here. Uh, I think one thing that we're talking about all the time is authenticity, obviously, and it goes down to obviously resonating with the audience, but making sure that the content is on target. 
So any success that we see a lot of our clients have, you know, Disney does a great job of really activating their influencer audience just as they would any consumer. So they're finding creators that are fans and love their products and their platforms and their content. And that's the consistent story. It's all about experience as well. It's not solely about the content. It's about the Disney experience and the Disney brand. So with every single activation they have, every movie, um, there's an influencer component typically, and it will vary depending upon whether they have the rock in their back pocket or not, uh, as far as what they activate and what they do, but it has to resonate with what they're trying to accomplish. So another thing is an awareness campaign is very different than a campaign that you're solely looking at converting and people purchasing products around. So what does that mean for our clients and what is the proper segment of the right type of people to help amplify that message out there. So that's one thing that I'd say I see across the board, whether it's in entertainment or everyone is trying to connect personally still today because we are so disconnected all the time. So how do we bring that content into a live experience? Yeah, the only thing I'll add is, I think it's really the trick of it is how much you know going in and up front. Um, you know, Tung, you were talking a lot about sort of essentially the, you know, consumer insights and journey mapping. Um, you know, just to use a, a simple example, you know, if you think about a, like the latest Oceans movie, which was all women, um, thinking about, you know, will there be a segment of the audience that will care because it's women-led or because they love the Oceans franchise or because they love the genre or because they love you know, to go to films that depict minorities or, or whatever. So there's all these kind of hot buttons, but um, you can't sort of optimize in reverse. If you haven't thought about it up front, it's very hard to go, gosh, you know, women just aren't showing up. They don't care. We need to pivot. Um, you know, ideally, you've, you've mapped that out and gone, you know, here's what we believe are the set of things that will be triggers or that will be effective and then you know it's optimizing across but you do have to do that initial work up front of thinking about what the the options could be and that's that's the trick because um, you know we as an industry we learn to place very big bets um, and they're usually single bets it's kind of Super Bowl thinking right it's like all your dreams and hopes and budget go into this one piece of creative um, and digital is all about optimization, so. So how do you activate an influencer? How do you, how, even if you have a paid influencer with the influencer agencies that we have sitting here, when you all need to, you know, twist their arm to get more involved, and certainly this is something that we deal with all the time with all of our movie and TV projects is how do we get the movies, uh, the actors in a program to activate more effectively? What are some of the things that you all are seeing in terms of how to fine tune their efforts? Put it in the agreement. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is true. <laughs> uh, it, it sounds comical. I mean, we see this but, all the time. And but it's really true. Like people go, oh, wow, this person's going to be amazing, this huge <laughs> influencer. And they're like, they're not going to post for you. And like, you know, with right. not always, right? You assume that because they're big on social, they'll be aligned with that desire. So I, I know that that doesn't always work out. So it's just a good thing to define up front. I think, I think authenticity is, uh, is, the, is the other really important part. So that, you know, I think as, as, as long as like the talent is really invested in the project, right, and can, can sort of in, in, like uh, communicate that enthusiasm, I think that's really important because, you know, when um, in the influencer space, I think people can sort of detect phonies and there's a lot of paid content out there. And so if you have um, really interesting content that's delivered by someone who's passionate about what they're talking about, I think that's going to perform miles better than just paying someone to, to reference the project. Yeah, and arguably contractual requirements are kind of the, uh, the opposite of an influencer being um, authentic about their support of a, of a product. Um, sometimes, well, these guys are actors, so maybe they're really good at pretending. <laughs> but um, 
Yeah, I think you know some influencers um, are really good at building awareness for brands um, if they have a large following, and then others are better at actually generating purchase intent, um, and that's partly about um, their following and how invested their followers are into the person and how much and what lengths they'll go to to do whatever the influencer tells them to do. And it's partly about how they uh, portray the, the product in the particular integration. And I think um, those are really important things to, to measure in terms of track records of, of such influencers. You guys probably do that kind of thing, I bet. Yeah, I'll, I'll let her add more on that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it gets back to a lot of coaching too. That's why there are so many different people in the industry that work with talent, whether it's traditional talent or digital talent. Um, you want to find the right talent to match with the authentic content, but there's we're all humans and there's an element of, of talent management that goes into any effective campaign to make sure that it does feel authentic. Um, so I think there wouldn't be many of the agencies in the world if uh, we didn't have that element of talent and variability that uh, lives with people. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think one of the ways that we look at it is um, the way a virus spreads or like an epidemiology model is no different than an influencer model. Um, so I think one of the things that we're looking at is there's obviously a message that's trying to be spread. That's why they want to activate the influencer. But what we like to do to make that influencer activation successful is what is the propensity and how strong is that bond between like the influencer and their audience by using like multiple different metrics. Because if we can measure that, then that increases the chances of that message being spread to the consumer and that consumer taking the action. Um, so we like to kind of approach it from like the same lens of an epidemiology model. And so what sort of metrics are you looking at? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we look is the audience's existing um, like content consumption, both on social as well as offline in terms of the types of shows that they're consuming. If we're specifically working with a brand that is looking to activate influencers, so let's just say they're a CPG brand um, or they're an auto company, what we look at is the propensity for that consumer to actually buy and that propensity that the, in, that the audience is already displaying and engaging with the influencer. Um, so everything from sentiment to online and offline purchase data um, to content consumption behavior, we use all of those inputs to basically measure that relationship between the influencer as well as the audience because similar to a, vir 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 a virality model, that's essentially how you get viruses spread. Um, so, speaking of influencers, I'm sure everybody in the room a week ago saw that Jennifer Aniston activated on Instagram or a week and a half ago, which was, you know, phenomenal. And the idea of, and she confessed that she was, you know, an active Instagram user, but, you know, under a sort of a, you know, ghost account. Um, and to see the uh, effect of her activation over the course of just 24 hours was mind-boggling. And what, I think, 14 million followers in a day and, you know, tens of 10 million, you know, likes per post uh, every f few days. And obviously, in, in advance of her, you know, Apple TV Plus TV show, so Apple was very pleased about that. But, uh, you know, that's sort of like the ultimate best case scenario, and she, you know, she's a big star, but that proves that she's a, a superstar. That's enormous. And so that becomes everybody's, like, case study in terms of the power of an influencer. What, what do you all, what was your, what were your thoughts about that, anybody? Well, I think one of the things that social media does is to sort of flatten things out so that, you know, you can have a personal relationship with a star of Jennifer gender, gender Aniston's level, right? And so um, I think that that's, you know, for as per an influencer campaign, right, that's a way for you to sort of personally reach, you know, your target audience um, in a way that, you know, doesn't feel like it would have been attainable before, right? So now I can be Jennifer Aniston's friend in a way that I could never be before. 
Well, I thought it was cool. Um, I, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, it's not all that surprising, though, given the impact of Jennifer Aniston. And we've seen people like Chrissy Teigen or other people who are traditional talent, but they toggle on the influencer landscape, and they've done it so well. Um, so for someone with the bankability of Jennifer Aniston to, to do that, uh, it's, you know, it proves the value of, you know, Dwayne The Rock Johnson's following and the fact that the bankable stars still have a massive appeal. Um, but it is, it does vary depending upon what you're trying to accomplish. So I'd say um, it's definitely great to see. Uh, and I think to your point, the consumers can relate directly to the talent. Um, so hopefully it will continue to transform as more and more people engage. So one of you all mentioned predictions earlier. Touch, was it you, Tom? Yeah. So predictive data is something that uh, the movie business obviously plays with heavily. Well, I don't know if everybody knows this, but every week um, as movies are preparing to open, and this, this being Tuesday, like today's a heavy day across town with emails and texts and faxes and smoke signals being sent up predicting how every movie is going to open and and the question is why who you know what what difference does it make if you predict it correctly or not and you know the traditional movie marketers all trace this back to um, a Coca-Cola marketing executive who came over to Columbia Pictures a few decades ago who brought some of that marketing methodology of predicting how well a campaign was going to impact sales. And so now every, well certainly, m well the big question is on the green lighting side, when you're looking at a script with a budget and a marketing budget you're trying, essentially you're saying, you know, given these, you know, metrics, you know, we've got uh, Terminator at $180 million budget with these movie stars opening on this date, this is what we think it will open at. And so predictions are a huge component of the film business. On the TV side, it's obviously a different so, sort of set of predictions. Um, and, and measuring success of a campaign um, and, and measuring the success of a premiere in regards to a pickup is really what it's all about. So that's, I just wanted to talk about predictive data and what you guys are seeing in terms of the data that you collect and you see and how that's being used. Sort of, sort of a wide question, but in term, the, the real question is, what of the data that you're seeing are you using to predict outcomes? I can talk a little bit about the, the opening gross part, if you like. And really, that's kind of come from the traditional world of movie distribution, where once you know the opening gross for the weekend, you can basically use a spreadsheet to calculate the total revenue of the film and the total profitability of the film. And so that's why so much effort went into um, so many resources go into the opening weekend. And so and, you know, everyone's bonuses at the studio are based on how does it perform on the opening weekend. And so it's all been set up around that model, which is why everyone cares so much about it. But that's, of course, all kind of shifted dramatically now that the releasing model is, is becoming so different. And some of the studios, um, with some of the studios are starting to introduce um, different models for measuring success internally. Um, and so I think while opening weekend gross will still be important, it will be not the only factor that second part of your question about prediction, um, I'm not in the game of predicting opening grosses, but what we do is uh, we have some machine learning which is all about predicting um, content, predicting titles that an individual will really love based on um, how they've rated other titles in our app. And so um, one of the questions that begins to emerge with this proliferation of platforms is when you sit down to watch TV, you're like, what the hell should I watch? <laughs> so, um, strive to answer that question by each week giving you just five things that we know you're going to really love 
across a, a variety of different genres. And we're really confident that if you watch any, of, any one of those, you're going to love it. So, and that's all built on machine learning, but we don't position it like that because consumers don't really care about ML or, or you know, AI or any of those things. They just want to know that it's magically great at producing predictions for them. Yeah, and I think um, to your point, the, the old model was very much like, in terms of like being able to like predict movies was like, all right, what are some comparable titles with similar star power and what was their opening box office gross and then 80% of the total revenue is gonna fall into theatrical and 20% is going to fall into all these other buckets like home entertainment and, and streaming and all that. What that old model doesn't take into account um, and, and that model has like been around for years is how much social can influence and change behavior. Um, and so I think for, for one of the studios that we have been working with, it's um, we've seen a lot of correlations between social data and how particular topics, um, whether it's related to the movie or around a particular theme of the movie, can be predictive um, in terms of box office revenue. Um, and so the correlation with that, with those data points, is very strong. Um, and you know we believe that that can also be built into the model to essentially build something that's a little bit more predictable. Um, unfortunately, during the current green lighting phase, a lot of studio executives and creatives, um, they're not, to Tanya's point earlier, they're not going into those rooms and saying, we're gonna produce a film um, because uh, we're gonna produce this kind of film because 80% of the people are talking about this particular topic and the star power is going to be X and Y and Z. Um, it's, it's definitely like an afterthought, but the more predictable we can be during the green lighting stage, that is ultimately what helps um, the profit and loss statements for their estimation process. A few questions, and you have to speak loud. Take that one. Um, so are you kind repeat of asking? The, repeat his question oh, somehow. Oh, gosh. Um, so is, there, <laughs> so is, the, is the question how are studios using data to make decisions on green lighting? Well, it was. Creative. Yeah. yeah, so it's basically your, your, uh, your central thesis, if I'm understanding it, is that by the machines gauging what people like based on what they've historically liked. How is that stifling, if you will? I mean, you call it innovation. I would say, what is the machine's role in forcing people to want stuff that they don't want? Um, I, I think of it more in the context of like, I mean, this often comes up in the context of social media networks and the news feed, right? Like if I am heavily left, I see everything that's heavily left. I believe that the whole world is, I can't even imagine an alternative view, and there's nothing being pushed to me that would challenge my way of seeing the world um, or my framework for it. Um, I, I think the short answer is, I mean, I don't think that any kind of ML or any sort of advanced data is so influential that it's actually going to be problematic at this stage. I think it's a very real thing to think about for the future. Um, but I think it, it actually raises a bigger, you know, almost ethical question of whose role is it to encourage people to have a broad diversity of taste or to be open to watching films that they wouldn't want to watch, right? Like, is that the role of education? Is it the role of 
the entertainment industry? Is it the role of government? I don't know. So it, it, to me, that's more of an ethical question as opposed to, um, as opposed to sort of a, a technical one. Yeah, and I, I would I think that's a that raises so many uh, points for me personally. I, th I think that's a really great question. Um, I I think as much a, as much as like we're up here talking about data, there's still there's an art to the science, and and that shouldn't go away. Um, and there's a certain you know level of intuition that a creative brings into a project, um, and data shouldn't limit that creativity. It should only enhance it and give that creative the guardrails it needs to um, create, whether it's content or social, whatever it is. I think the second point um, that comes up for me in particular is that a lot of these algorithms or, or you know, decisions that are recommended, whether it's for, from AI or any type of machine learning platform, they only take into account what happened historically. And if there weren't enough inputs um, to basically surface uh, if there weren't enough input, so for example, if all the data that we're looking at is people who, if, if the studio created content that was purely sci-fi, then the output is going to be keep making more sci-fi. So you have to give the model diversity and you have to look at the outliers because in the outliers, that's where creative is actually sparked. Yeah, I think it also depends on what you're trying to get your model, what you're trying to optimize it for. So. If you're just trying to optimize for, let's say, revenue based on past revenue, then maybe you have that problem that you that you talk about. But you could also try to say, all right, where have we underinvested and looked at essentially like projects that have performed better than expected that have fewer competitors out there. So I mean, not that you can ever get great entertainment from you know from algorithms, but like I don't think it's necessarily the outcome of using data that you end up with only one type of movie because historically that's done well and now we've made more of them. So I think you know uh, a real good sort of a, a sort of analytics department is going to think about all right what can we learn in terms of areas for underinvestment and um, you know who can we appeal to that hasn't been appealed to with whatever the current sort of trend is. Ladies and gentlemen, I, oh, I was just going to say just, one last thing. Is that okay? One last thing. I was going to say I wouldn't be too worried about it because we've got more data than ever available to studios and, pr and content producers. And arguably, we're living in a golden age of scripted content right now. There's more great shows across a spectrum of genres than anyone can watch right now, I would say many people agree with. So Brooke, Derek, Tanya, Talon, and Jeff, thank you very much for being here today. <laughs> and hope you all enjoy Digital Hollywood all week. Yeah, please do. Please do. <laughs>